Welcome to another edition of Micro Lessons in Microblasting. I'm Colin. And I'm Anders. And today we're going to talk about five factors that lead to successful deburring. This is a great starting point for 80% of your deburring applications. Abrasive selection is the most important factor for any microblasting process. The abrasive needs to be tailored to the base material and the type of burr on the part, whether you're working with peak, torlon, aluminum, or titanium. Typically, we recommend starting with a soft abrasive like wheat starch, plastic media, or pumice because the burr only needs to be knocked off, not cut off. So a soft abrasive works fine. Even if you're working with a harder material like stainless steel, the soft abrasive can transfer enough energy into the root of the burr to remove it without altering the surface finish. If a softer media doesn't remove the burr, work your way up to a harder media like aluminum oxide. Just remember, aluminum oxide has a tendency to mat the finish on metal. So follow that up with glass bead to restore that satin finish. Operators who are used to working with hand tools, like picks and knives, tend to hold the nozzle like right on top of the burr. That's not effective. It's actually more effective to hold the nozzle back at least a quarter of an inch away from the part surface. Interestingly, the abrasive will continue to accelerate even after it leaves the nozzle, so this space between the nozzle and the part gives the abrasive enough energy to knock off the burr. We've also seen operators use the nozzle like a scraper. Be careful, our tungsten carbide nozzles will scratch your part. Don't drill the abrasive stream directly into the root of the burr. Holding the nozzle stationary can damage the part surface without actually removing the burr. Instead, sweep the nozzle back and forth. This will allow the abrasive to strike the burr from multiple angles. Most people want to crank the blast pressure up to the highest setting, but the highest setting is not always the best option. That's right. Blast pressure is very part dependent. You want to use a pressure that's high enough to quickly deburr, but not so high that the abrasive digs into the base material. For instance, if you're working with a softer material such as peak, you may want to start with a lower pressure like 40 to 60 PSI. Metal parts, on the other hand, can tolerate more pressure, so you can blast those with 80 to 100 PSI. If you're not sure where to start, but you had Comco process samples, look at our sample parts report. Where possible, we try to run samples at a range of pressures so that we can recommend the optimal setting for your specific deburring application. Deburring applications benefit from a rich abrasive stream. We recommend starting out with a medium-sized tank orifice, like a 30 or 40 thousandths, and working up from there. But remember, the tank orifice should never be larger than the nozzle opening, or abrasive will clog in the nozzle. And while you do want a rich abrasive stream, you don't want to see abrasive exiting the nozzle. An air stream that rich means the abrasive is moving very slowly. There's one exception to this rule. The only time you would like to have a lean abrasive stream is if you're deep burring the interior space of a part. Too much abrasive may clog the part, so use a smaller orifice. To recap, the five factors to successful deburring are start with a soft abrasive and work up. Don't place the nozzle right against the burr. Instead, hold it at least a quarter of an inch away. Don't drill. Sweep the nozzle over the part. Blast pressure is part dependent, so check your sample parts report or call us. Use a 30 or 40 thousandths tank orifice. They should create a rich enough abrasive stream for deburring. If you think you can improve your deburring process, but aren't sure where to start, give us a call and we can run your sample parts in our application lab. We're happy to help you out. 